All right, guys, we have a good show lined up for you. Chief Rashal Brackney just had a press conference um, at 11 o'clock today. That press conference undoubtedly it now is the, um, the lead of the show. It was not going to be the lead of the show, but when a police chief who got canned by local government holds a press conference with an attorney and demands $3 million from the jurisdiction... Guess what happens? That becomes the lead of the show. So we're going to analyze the Brackney. Um, Brackney is suing the city of Charlottesville for wrongful termination. I'll say that again. Brackney is suing the city of Charlottesville for wrongful termination, and she's asking $3 million for wrongful term termination. She's called her attorney, called the, uh, the police officer surveys, that the PBA conducted, called them fake surveys today. She is calling Charlottesville government an old white boys club. Brackney said today that white males need to be held accountable within the police department. Brackney also said today that she was terminated for dismantling white su supremacy throughout Charlottesville police in the city of Charlottesville. And guess what? Brackney is not opposed to having her job back in Charlottesville government. I don't see that happening um, at all. So a lot to cover today on the program. Dude, the soap opera that is Charlottesville government continues. I mean, I thought, let me get to the show. Give the show a like and a share. This show is going to be red hot, red hot, red hot, red hot. Tell your friends, share the show, like the show, hit that like button right now. I want you guys to hit the like button right now. We do a lot of work putting effort into this program. The only thing we ask in return is you guys like and share the show. Hit the like button right now. Hit it right now. Um, if you have questions, comments, if you want to get to the bottom of what the heck is happening in local government, put it in the feed, and I will uh, offer some insight from my perspective. Um, of Charlottesville government that continues to be, as the world turns, a young and the restless battle, guys. So much to cover on the program. Judah Wickow, give the show a like and a share when you're ready. Ray Cadell, welcome to the program. Johnny, Johnny Ornalis, thank you, my friend. We appreciate you, Johnny Ornalis. Alan Polson, thank you very much. Cameron Savage, thank you, thank you very much for liking the show. Hit the like button right now. Ray Cadell, thank you for sharing the show. Punch the like button. That's all we ask in return from you. J Dobbs, I'm ready to rock and roll. Good Tuesday afternoon, guys. My name is Jerry Miller, and welcome to the I Love Seville show. It's Tuesday, and my phone has been buzzing off the hook. Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, absolutely on fire right now with chitter-chatter of Chief Brackney, who is suing the city of Charlottesville for $3 million. You heard me correctly. The former police chief can pink slip fired acts for performance issues, according to local government, is now suing the city that she formerly represented for a cool three million bucks 11 a.m literally 96 minutes ago she was on the courts she was on the steps literally the steps of city hall with an attorney looking to host a media circus and explain why Three million dollars is fair compensation for wrongful termination. We'll cover that today on the I Love Seville show. I will ask questions like, what's the payday going to look like? How is local government going to handle this? Will Chief Brattany consider returning to Charlottesville as police chief? Is three million enough? Is the reality she's going to get nothing? Will this even make it to court? What has this done from her reputation? Does, did she deserve to get canned? What's the impact on Charlottesville? What's the impact on Elmore County? What's the impact on Central Virginia? So much to cover as former Charlottesville Police Chief Brackney now demanding 
Three million dollars for wrongful termination. We'll also talk the basketball game tonight. Virginia Hoops men's basketball opens as a 14-point favorite. They're hosting Navy. Nine o'clock tip-off ACC Network. Wahoo Football hosts Notre Dame on Saturday. National TV, ABC, 7.30 kick. Notre Dame a five and a half point favorites as they head from South Bend to Charlottesville for a clash, we hope, of epic proportions. Our friend Alex Erpe on the program. So much to cover on the Red on the I Love Seville show. It is red hot today. Red hot. The lead of the program undoubtedly has got to be a press release that I received last night just after midnight. I will say it again. I received a press release from the Cochran firm just after midnight last night about a press conference with Charles Tucker of the Cochran firm, the Esquire, the lawyer, the attorney, who is representing Rashal Brackney, the former police chief of Charlottesville, in a wrongful termination lawsuit. Today at 11 a.m., in front of City Hall, Brackney and her attorney, Charles Tucker, held a media circus. And in that media circus, they tried to manage the perception or dictate the narrative of wrongful termination in the former chief of police in the city of Charlottesville. Let me give you the background first. Chief Brackney canned earlier this year for what Mr. Chip Boyles has said as losing the trust, the faith of rank and file officers within the Charlottesville Police Department. Former city manager Chip Boyles, who was the interim city manager, fired Brackney because he feared if Brackney stayed on the job, more of Charlottesville's police department would quit, hit the road jack, would leave the CPD for other police positions throughout the country, the Commonwealth, and Central Virginia. Mr. Chip Boyles, the former interim city manager, who resigned in unexpected fashion, well, now we may have a good idea why that resignation happened. And frankly speaking, I had said on this network weeks ago that Mr. Boyle's resignation was likely tied to an impending lawsuit from Chief Brackney for wrongful termination. My crystal ball was correct. It often is. Mr. Boyles writes an op-ed in the Daily Progress. Now we know that op-ed was penned or guided or directed by a PR firm in Northern Virginia. This op-ed goes into the print and digital editions of the local newspaper and explains why former interim city manager Chip Boyles fired Chief Rashal Brackney. The premise or the impetus of the pink slip was losing the confidence of rank and file officers and the fear that attrition and turnover would continue during or, or admits the Charlottesville Police Department at a prolific clip. Mr. Boyles wanted to hedge or prevent that attrition, that turnover from continuing. So in his mind, he cut the head off the snake and the head was the police chief. With the benefit of hindsight, we realized that that op-ed in the Daily Progress that Mr. Boyles signed was 
directed, guided, created, written by a PR firm outside the area. We know this because community stakeholders FOIA'd Freedom of Information Act, Mr. Boyles and his personal email account, which he was communicating from to the Northern Virginia PR firm. So the saga continues. 90, 100 and about, about an hour and 15, an hour and 45 minutes ago, Brackney is in front of City Hall with her attorney, Charles Tucker, who's dressed in a blue navy pinstripe suit with a yellow tie and a well-manicured haircut, demanding $3 million dollars from Charlottesville taxpayers, your pocketbook, my pocketbook. My business is in the city of Charlottesville. I pay taxes to City Hall. You live in the city of Charlottesville. You pay real estate taxes to City Hall. Your business is in Charlottesville. You pay taxes to the local jurisdiction. Any payday that comes to the fired police chief is our money. It's our money that's being allocated. Allocated to a lawsuit. Allocated to what some would say is extortion. Allocated to what some would say is the utilization of race as leverage to get a bag of dinero. and allocated away from schools, children, economic development, allocated away from helping the next generation prosper in our community, allocated away from bridging and closing and narrowing the wealth gap that is undoubtedly happening, allocated away from diversity efforts, equity building efforts. Friends, this is a big deal. This is a huge deal. So here's where we stand. We have a former interim city manager in Mr. Chip Boyles who fired a police chief and Dr. Rashal Brackney. And Mr. Chip Boyles has said how he pink slip, fired, canned, hit the road jack, Chief Brackney he would have done differently with the benefit of hindsight. He has said openly and on the record he regrets how he handled this. He has since retired. Unexpectedly in surprising fashion. As interim city manager and now is working in the Fredericksburg Stafford area. In a governmental role. We now realize, because we're intelligent individuals and we're able to dot the I's, cross the T's, read tea leaves, use the eye test and common sense, that perhaps that unexpected retirement was to insulate himself from a wrongful termination lawsuit. Today, an hour and 46 minutes ago, a smooth, fast-talking, slick, pinstripe suit-wearing, well-manicured Charles Tucker of the Cochran firm demanded three million dollars of our taxpayer dollars. Three million dollars of the money we allocate to the city of Charlottesville, a budget, a city, a jurisdiction that runs on a 200 million rough budget. 
So over 1% of the yearly budget, Charles Tucker wants for Chief Rashal Brackney. The leverage of their lawsuit, the foundation of their lawsuit, the essence of their lawsuit is race and the wrongful termination due to race. Mr. Tucker, the Esquire, the attorney, the lawyer, talked about fake surveys from the Police Benevolent Association. Chief Brackney talked about an old boys club that is Charlottesville government. Well, first of all, there's three people on city council that are women. One of them is black. Heather Hill, Cena McGill, and Nakia Walker. Three of the five, 60% of council is women. Old boys club, not so fast, my friends. The city attorney is a woman. One of the key deputy city managers is a female. The old boys club moniker is a strategy to try to manage perception when in fact it's far from reality. Brackney ends her speech on City Hall steps in front of City Hall by saying she was terminated for dismantling white supremacy throughout the city of Charlottesville. Dismantling white supremacy throughout the city of Charlottesville. Who does that sound like to you? Who does that sound like to you? Sounds like the mayor. It's no secret that the two are allies. Partners, chums, friends, strategic alliance created between the two leaders in this municipality. And today, we as citizens must sit back and unfortunately read in local newspapers, local television, local radio, regional newspapers, if you don't think this is gonna be in the Richmond Times Dispatch, you're huffing glue out of a Ziploc bag. If you don't think this is gonna be mentioned in the Washington Post, you're huffing glue out of a Ziploc bag. If you don't think this is gonna get some traction from cable television, you are, you get my point. If you don't think this is gonna get some traction countrywide, outside the country, you're a local in La Cabeza, Chico. I am infuriated. I am frustrated, demoralized, disturbed, depressed, downright downtrodden by individuals leveraging race for personal gain. We saw tactics like this from former President Donald Trump. And the former president got deserving SHIT. That similar 
strategic mindset is here on the bricks, the streets, the asphalt, the sidewalk of the city of Charlottesville. Just like we called out the former president for BS divisive tactics, we must, as a community, call out individuals within our community who are, using, who are utilizing the same BS tactics. Three million dollars? How does this make us look? How does this make us look in central Virginia with some of the outer counties? How does this make us look in the Commonwealth? How does this make us look in the Mid-Atlantic? How does this make us look in the East Coast? How does this make us look in the country? How does this make us look in the world? You know how? Like clowns. That's how. Oh, there's Charlottesville up to it again with its dysfunction. Oh, there's Charlottesville once again having issues. Who's exhausted with that? I am. When you ask for over 1% of a jurisdiction's yearly budget for a wrongful termination suit, you're taking money away from school reconfiguration. You're taking money away from supporting STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math for the next generations of Charlottesvilleans. You're taking money away that can be allocated to coding education. You're taking money away from the West Main Streetscape project. You're taking money away from small business funding to help said small businesses make it through the pandemic. You're taking money away from the revitalization of the downtown mall who undoubtedly has suffered throughout COVID. You're taking money away from building the brand that we call Charlottesville. And I'm gonna tell you right now, Almaro County, Louisa, Fluvanna, Orange, Green, Gordonsville, Nelson. If you don't think this impacts you, you are living in an unrealistic silo that we call life. Fluvanna, Green, Orange, Louisa, Gornsville, Nelson. Your municipalities and jurisdictions are undoubtedly associated to the city of Charlottesville. Go on vacation. Tell someone you're from Louisa, Almaro, Nelson, Green, Fluvanna, Orange, Gordonsville. People will scratch their head and say, where the hell is that? Then tell someone you're from Charlottesville and they'll be like, oh, I know exactly where that is. I know exactly where that spot is. UVA. I know exactly where that is. Breweries and wineries. I know exactly where that is. I saw uh, some red light musician play at one of the fantastic venues. Oh, I know exactly where that is. A12, 2017. Oh, I know exactly where that is. The mayor comparing your town to male ejaculation and rape. Oh, I know exactly where that is. The police chief suing the city for three million bucks. We have twenty fifty two days left with the mayor in office. I said yesterday that the newly picked Interim city manager Mark Woolley should do whatever he could possibly do to stay away from the mayor if he wanted to keep his job long term. 
Now the newly minted interim city manager, Mark Woolley, who I think is a great hire. is going to be slightly distracted by an impending lawsuit where over 1% of his jurisdiction budget hangs in purgatory in the balance. Welcome to Charlottesville, Mr. Woolley. Your resume and your experience, I applaud. They speak for themselves. I think you were a good hire. Your first day on the job, your former police chief, you're going to have to deal with because she's suing for $3 million. Lisa Costello leaves this comment on one of the 15 Facebook pages we're streaming on. Growing up here, I thought I was the stuff bragging to family to members in other counties. Today, when someone asks where I live, I say, shh, shh, shh. Then I'm finally able to muster up the courage to say Charlottesville, and I await the questions and response from the folks that I'm talking with, unsure of how they will reply. Scott Aaronworth, the attorney in Virginia Beach, says, isn't Brackney like a coach? When the players lose confidence in their coach, the coach gets fired. Grayson, watching in our I Love Seville group, says the police chief was losing people left and right within the department. The right decision was made to let her go. This will be in media outlets Commonwealth-wide, regional-wide, East Coast-wide, country-wide. Alan Polson, Scott Aaronworth, and Ray Cadell, thank you for liking and engaging with the program. Mike Goodman, hello and welcome to the show. Cameron Savage, hello and welcome to the show. Terry Wick, hello and welcome to the program. Marissa Bess, welcome to the show. Eventually we stand up. We must stand up and say enough is enough. Now I'm going to ask you this question. And I want to get to football and basketball, but first I've got to get some things off my chest, out of my brain, out of my mouth, and to you, the viewers and listeners. I would expect that this lawsuit will never make it to court. I would expect that this lawsuit will be settled in a closed door scenario as quickly as possible. I would expect that this lawsuit will eventually lead to a payday for Chief Brackney, not at the three million clip, but if I had to put the over or under at one million dollars, I would take the over that Brackney's gonna get paid. Brackney is going to walk with a bag of money. And she has probably this kind of compensation arrangement set up with the attorney, Charles Tucker. Tucker and his firm are likely going to keep anywhere from 25 to 50% of the payday. It's going to have no money out of Brackney's pocket up front. The law firm and the attorney will get a percentage of the bag of loot when said bag of loot is allocated to Brackney. So the attorney and the law firm have every reason to go balls to the wall and get as much money as humanly possible because they have skin in the game and they get a taste of that cash. Kevin Higgins watching the program says the Cochran firm no doubt fed the mayor the questions on the six-hour council meeting when the mayor went on a rant about this issue. The ex-chief was on the line as well. What a circus. This is a question that I legitimately want to know the answer to. Thank you, Kevin Higgins, for bringing that to my attention. Neil Williamson, welcome to the program. This is legitimately what I want to know the answer to. 
someone should FOIA Nakia Walker's phone and email accounts. And I legitimately, genuinely want to know the answer to this. Did the mayor of Charlottesville correspond with the Cochran firm and Charles Tucker in any capacity before today's press conference? Did Charles Tucker and the Cochran firm, did Chief Brackney, after she was terminated as police chief of Charlottesville, did either Charles Tucker or Rashal Brackney correspond, strategize, conversate, or plan anything with the mayor after the police chief was fired from her job? Because if the former police chief strategized with the mayor after she was canned, that's a conflict of interest. If legal representation for the police chief corresponded with the active mayor of a jurisdiction, planning, strategizing, conversating, spitballing, anything about a potential lawsuit, an impeding lawsuit, a lawsuit coming down the pipeline, that is a conflict of interest. FOIA, FOIA, FOIA. We should know If this strategy has been in the works for weeks, and if said strategy included or involved any acting or active elected officials or individuals employed by the city of Charlottesville, because that at best is conflict of interest, at worst illegal collusion. Ginny Bixby, Charlottesville Daily Progress. You're doing a very good job on the city of Charlottesville beat. You're a young, new, rookie reporter. We'll cut to the chase. And so far, Ginny Bixby at the Charlottesville Daily Progress, you have exceeded people's expectations with your coverage of this soap opera that we call local government in Charlottesville. Ginny Bixby, this is what you should be doing as a reporter. I hope your city editor is encouraging you to do this. If I was still employed at the Daily Progress, I would be encouraging you to do this. I would encourage you to leverage every aspect of FOIA to request correspondence, all correspondence, from the mayor's email accounts, professional and personal, and cell phone records professional and personal, between Brackney's firing and today's press conference at City Hall front door. Macy Moore's CBS 19. David Folke, the news director of NBC 29. Giles Morris, Charlottesville Tomorrow. Is it still Aaron Richardson at the Daily Progress? There's a lot of term over there. I've heard recently Jenny Rector is no longer the city editor of the DP. Upper management, David Folke, NBC29, news director, you're there. Giles Morris, executive director, Charlottesville Tomorrow. Ginny Bixby, Charlottesville beat reporter, Daily Progress. Ben Hitchcock, editor, Sevo Weekly. FOIA, the phone records, personal and biz, personal and professional, and FOIA the email accounts, personal and professional, of Nakia Walker, and see if there's been correspondence between Brackney and Walker since Brackney was canned. And see if there's correspondence between the attorney, Charles Tucker, and the mayor of Charlottesville. At best, that's a conflict of interest. At worst, that's a legal collusion. Do that now. Initiate the progress now. We as taxpayers deserve to know. Sean Tubbs, Sean Tubbs, hear me, Sean Tubbs. Please do that now. Wow, oh, so good. So frustrating. I'm just ready for government to be in the background, creating policy that's consistent background, creating policy that positively promotes the community, politicians in the background where we may know their name, but they're not front and center for poetry, for lawsuits, and for $3 million 
money grabs. Two other items. If you've got comments, put them in the feed. Comments, put them in the feed. Comments, put them in the feed now. I will relay them on air. Punch the like button if you agree with me. Hit the like button hard on Facebook if you agree with me. And share the show with your friends because you know people need to hear what I'm talking because I'm coming from a common sense, reasonable, fact-based standpoint. All I'm saying on this show is common sense, I test, reasonable human thinking. How do you even talk sports after this crap? Notre Dame is a five and a half point favorite. The ball game Saturday evening at Scott Stadium, 730 national television. We hope the national TV exposure of ABC and a UVA Notre Dame clash can supersede the national exposure of a police chief former can going after a three million dollar money grab. We hope. Bronco Mendenhall in his press conference yesterday, Bronco and his presser was very, is the word clandestine secretive, Judah? Was very clandestine with his speech. Is that fair? was very clandestine with his update on Brennan Armstrong's rib injury. I don't think we'll see Brennan Armstrong play. The games that matter are Pittsburgh and Virginia Tech. You beat the Pitt Panthers and the Virginia Tech Hokies. You, you're the Coastal Division champion, and you're playing in an ACC championship with a chance to get a big-time bowl berth. I don't think an ACC team is going to the BCS this year because the ACC is a weak conference from a football standpoint this year. You play Brennan Armstrong when he's at not 100% against the Fighting Irish. You risk that ribcage getting injured even more, and then Brennan Armstrong misses the games that matter, Pittsburgh and Virginia Tech. I say you give Jay Wolfhook the first year under center, and you allow Wolfhook to show what he's about against the top number 10 team in the country, who are a five-and-a-half-point favorite, national television, ABC. Basketball. Navy at UVA, Scott, uh, John Paul Jones Arena tonight. Navy at UVA, John Paul Jones Arena tonight, 9 p.m. kickoff, 9 p.m. tip-off, excuse me, 9 p.m. tip-off, ACC Network. The Wahoos, a 14-point favorite. Bennett's boys, back on the hardwood. A couple of key transfers in the starting lineup. And one of the fan base's all-time favorite players, Kia Clark. Back in action. Love you, Kia Clark. Love you so, so much, Kia Clark. I still have dreams about that pass you made to Mabidi Diakite to get us into the national championship, Kia Clark. Five foot seven, scrappy hustle and chutzpah, a guy that all of us can relate to. A five foot, five foot seven, 150 pound player with the heart of a warrior. Lastly, I encourage you to get tickets now. Get the link on screen if you could. J-Dubs, look at the screen in T-minus five seconds. Look at the screen in T-minus four seconds. Look at the screen in T-minus three seconds. Look at the screen in T-minus two seconds. Look at the screen right now. Right now. November 26th to January 30th, the Winter Wonder at Boar's Head Resort. November 26th to January 30th, the Winter Wonder at Boar's Head Resort. The lighting of acreage around Boar's Head for a festive experience of memorable proportions, perfect for date night, perfect for family and friends, and a way to welcome the holidays in to Charlottesville, Central Virginia, and the Commonwealth. Judah Wickhauer, my friend, let's welcome the Antonio Banderas of Finance to the program, the CEO of Emergent Financial Services, a good friend of this program. His name is Alex Erpe. He will be on screen in T minus four, T minus three, T minus two, T minus one. Que pasa, Alex? How are you? Doing well. How about you? My friend. Nice. Long time no see. I felt like I just saw you this morning on Real Talk. <laughs> it was a fun time. That was a great show this morning. My friend, I know this is new to you, and it just happened today. Any comments on today's press conference in front of City Hall and Chief Brackney and this With $3 the, uh, million dollar lawsuit? I, d I, I was a little surprised. I mean, you, you, Dan, you hate to see us in the news for these types of things. And it just, and I, I kind of feel bad for the Net City Council that now needs to deal with more holdover from just mismanagement at every step of the way. 
leading up to this. So it's just, it's, it's rough to see, but I, I was listening a little bit to you, and I think my suspicion is this is designed to end up in settlement. Yeah. Not in court. I think so, too. In fact, what we may do on tomorrow's program is we should consider the legacy of the two departing city councilors, Nakia Walker and Heather Hill, and what their four years on the dais have been like and how they will be remembered by Charlottesvillians for generations to come. We may consider that tomorrow. My friend, let's talk Wall Street. Let's talk Wall Street meets Main Street. Let's talk the divide that is Wall Street and Main Street. And let's talk markets that are green, green, green. Granted, they're a little down Yeah, they're a little down today. today. Little down SMP, today. But I mean, think about it. S&P is down today, and it's on track to have its first negative session in nine days. So, I mean, it, November's been a good month. November has been a good month for the markets. 2021 is certainly turning out to be a good year for the markets. Maybe not the dangbusters of, of March 2020 to December 2020, because, I mean, that's something you don't see every day. Um, but I think 2021 is looking to be, again, a, a good year for the markets. And just the, the money that is flowing in there is is tremendous and it's going to keep pushing the market up i believe tesla in the news anytime elon musk <laughs> tweets next thing you news. know he's in the news <laughs> he's in the news for trying to solve world hunger by selling some of his stock he's in the news for a deal with was it hertz, uh, hertz. it's interesting the the stock selling for a moment it has we talked about this a little bit last week that he he sort of showed through a little bit of analysis that a lot of times people will say, well, if you just did this, you would solve world hunger, but it's not quite so easy. The, the person who was trying to get him to donate part of his, uh, his Tesla stock to end world hunger couldn't really provide him with an answer on how that money would actually solve world hunger. That's right. right? He, he had to hedge it there. The interesting thing is that he's selling it. Because he faces a $15 billion tax bill. Exactly. Yeah. He's, so this is a smoke and mirrors play here. Mm -hmm. It's making him seem altruistic and philanthropic. Really, he's on the hook for 15 bill. Oh, is that what they do? You sell the stock to pay realized gains rather than risk the government coming in and coming after your unrealized Explain that gains. to the viewers. So the, the, the government is, is seriously considering... Um, Congress, I should say, in particular, is serious. It's not in the bill that just passed, but um, Congress is seriously considering a tax on unrealized gains. And what unrealized gain means is you buy a stock for $100. Let's say it goes up. Now it's worth 200 You haven't sold it yet. You don't have that $200 in your pocket. You still have just the share of stock. The government, if they tax unrealized gains, would come in there and say, because... You have a gain on this stock, even though you haven't sold it yet, we're going to tax you on this. And obviously that's a significant risk to an investor because it, it doesn't work the other way around. In other words, if that's my stock then declines in value again, the IRS doesn't come and say, oh, we mistakenly charged you, taxed you on gains last year, we're not going to give you back some money. It only ever works in one direction. So my suspicion is this is a little bit of a clever ploy on Elon's part of saying there's a lot of people calling for me to pay, my, pay taxes on unrealized gains. Why don't I just realize some gains and look altruistic while I'm doing it? I mean, it's called managing perception. Mm -hmm. Same strategy that this attorney and Brackney are trying to do in front of City Hall, Elon Musk is doing at a global level. $100,000 Tesla Model 3 cars potentially going to Hertz. This deal mm -hmm. now in peril. What seemed like a surefire bet last week may not come to fruition now. $100,000 Tesla is going to Hertz, a company that was essentially bankrupt and in the poo-poo, um, became a meme stock, Hertz, <laughs> is now yep. striking a potential $4.4 billion deal with the coolest EV company in the world, frankly, the coolest car company in the world in Tesla. This deal now in the purgatory of deals, meaning it may not come to fruition. What do you make of this? Hey, these are always tricky, and I was a little dubious about the deal even last week only in the sense of that there was conflicting information and anytime you have conflicting information because in other words um, Elon was saying we have the deal Hertz was saying we don't have the cars yet you sit there and you say why is there conflicting information here so anytime there's conflicting information you have to kind of worry that it's not set in stone and it looks like this one was not set in stone I don't know if that means they didn't sign anything and it was one of those handshake deals that handshake didn't translate to on paper or if it's an on-paper deal that had some kind of opt-out provision that someone is exercising. 
hard to, to know at this point. But it's always a little cautionary tale. Whenever there's conflicting information about a deal, you have to sort of take a step back. I always liken it to um, trades that happen in baseball at the trade deadline. As a Yankee fan, I've been burned by a lot of, Cliff Lee is coming to New York. And then before the end of the day, Cliff Lee is not coming to New York. He's going to Texas. And so until it's set in stone and you're getting conflicting information, it's not, it, it may not happen. Vanessa Parkhill, great friend of the program, similar ideology as us. Taxing unrealized gains is ridiculous. I respond 110% mm -hmm. absurd. How could taxing unrealized gains impact the economy? Alex Irving. Oh, it is, it is absurd. It, my, my concern is that, A, I mean, it's, it's obviously an attempt to get at the wealth of extremely rich people who have a lot of shares in a company that took off. It basically, it's after Elon Musk. In other words, last year, as an example, he went from rich to the richest man, one of the richest men in the world. So the government's looking at him saying, how do we get a piece of that? Because until he sells, he's not being paid a salary. He just owns a lot of shares in his own company. Until he sells that stock, the government can't get a piece of it. The IRS can't touch it, his money. So they're trying to get at this. Two, two issues that I have with this. First, you're going to inevitably cause some market manipulation here. And How what so? I'm, what I mean by that is if I'm an extremely wealthy investor and I have unrealized gains, massive unrealized gains in my portfolio in December that I'm going to be taxed on if they are still in my portfolio in December, what am I going to do with those gains? I'm probably going to sell some of it. And the reason I'm going to sell some of it is because if you're going to tax me on unrealized gains and then my stock declines in value, that tax money that I got taxed on is gone forever. You just nabbed 15% of gains I never saw, and I cannot recoup that money. So I'm going to try to recoup some of it now. And actually get a little cash and, and in my hand. And get a little hand. cash in my hand yeah, to it's pay like, this. Uh, one in the hand is, is better than two in the bush. Two in the bush, exactly. So now you're going to cause stock manipulation issues in December, January, February, in other words, leading up to tax day, where is, is Elon Musk selling Tesla stock because he doesn't think Tesla's going to do well anymore? Should I sell? Is he only selling because he needs to, he wants to lock in some gains as he's going to be taxed on unrealized gains? So you just enter in a whole another set of issues that you don't need. Because you, remember, the part of the goal of the stock market is to convey information. The price of a stock in an ideal world would simply convey to you what the market sees as the value of that company. If the price of a stock is now also has to convey who has a tax liability that they're going to have to deal with and what super rich person owns this stock that's going to have to dump some of it, then how do you as the average investor look at this and say, what's the actual value of this company? Its, it's price is moving because of things that have nothing to do with the company. So that's an issue. Secondly, uh, these things I always find as they're foolish ways to try to generate tax revenue because super rich people aren't stupid. They will move their wealth to items which cannot be uh, marked to market. And what I mean by that is if Elon Musk has, uh, to just use him as an example, not to pick on him, but he's an he's a easy example. It's an easy guy he's to got pick a on. Billion, he's, he's got a billion, yeah. He's got a billion dollars worth. Let's say he's got a billion dollars in, that he's going to have to pay in taxes on unrealized Tesla shares. Well, it, he might sit there and say, well, you know what? Maybe I'll transfer some of my billions to diamonds, to art. You're not going to come in and value. How are you going to come in and value my Picasso every year? What kind of unrealized gain am I going to Until a Picasso was sold on auction, how are you going to prove that this Picasso is, I could get another art dealer to come in and say, no, the Picasso hasn't increased in value, it's, it's worth the same. And this has happened all the time. Some of the wealthiest people in the world are private, privately wealthy, meaning doesn't show up on any uh, chart of Forbes 500 because they don't own public shares of companies. They own diamonds, they own art, they own private companies which real aren't valued, they own real estate. Real estate sometimes will show up. You can't hide it as much. But if you own, like, who, there are massive works of art out there that nobody knows who owns them because they're sold anonymously on auction. There are ways for extremely wealthy people to hide their wealth, and I'm not sure we really want to be encouraging them to do that because it's much more beneficial to us to tax what little comes. My concern, what I think my father probably shares this concern. He's commenting. Is that once you start 
taxing unrealized gains, you then eventually tax them on everybody. Will that overreach by the government IRS make it into people's retirement accounts? But not in terms of market manipulation, that's my concern that it will affect because if you have major players influencing the market for tax reasons and you're in funds, basic ETFs that have those stocks, you're affected. I think what his concern, my concern is, is once you go down the road of taxing unrealized gains, you set the precedent and you say, we're only going to do it for super rich people. Well, as we all know, the income tax was only supposed to hit the top 1% when it was first created in 1916. Now we all pay it. My concern is you don't want to be taxing the unrealized gains of ordinary people. And my concern is that that's where the IRS knows the real money is. They, there's not enough unrealized gains of extremely wealthy people to pay for all the programs that they are looking at. So my concern is that this starts with the very wealthy, and then before you know it, somebody with $100,000 in a retirement account is now having their unrealized gains taxed every year. Alex Erpe, CEO of Emergent Financial Services. We talked briefly, actually in depth, excuse me, on Real Talk this morning about inflation. Mm -hmm. We associated it with something that was very tangible and real for all of us. The Thanksgiving holiday that's right around the corner. We referenced a post I made on the I Love Seville Network about the cost of a 16-pound turkey, 2020 versus 2021. According to the Texas A&M AgriLife Institute, uh, 20, a 16-pound turkey in 2020, $28.80. A 16-pound turkey on average in America in 2021, $55.20. You're basically wow. 2x the cost of the bird for that cornucopia de deliciousness. What do you make of this? Where do you want to go with this topic? It's crazy. It just, I, I think it hits again the fact that, as we were talking about a little bit on Real Talk this morning, there's the headline inflation number that you see 5%. And there's the sticker shot that hits you when you go to the store. Because sometimes you go to the store. This is important right here. That's, that's 200. That's basically a 100% increase in the price of the trees two times. Yeah. One, two, say, two X up. Two X, right? That's way more than the 5% number you see on the news. And that's the issue. The 5%, 6% inflation number you see on the news. It's bogus. Has been manipulated. Yeah. And what I mean by that, I don't mean it in a nefarious way. But the ways the statistics are calculated for Wall Street, inflation, Main Street divide. It's not the average is, Joe that's feeling the 6% inflation pinch. Exactly. The average Joe is feeling, particularly with gas, 42%, as Keith was saying this morning. So you go to the pump. You're not, say, you're not going to the pump and saying, oh, this is 6% more expensive. You're saying this is 40% more expensive than last year. You go to the grocery store. Some of the things you buy are 8 to 10% more expensive, not 6 So the average Joe looks at the... The, the news and says, what are you talking about? 5%, 6% inflation. I'm seeing much higher than this in my average life. But of course, that number that you see in the headline has been massaged by statistics, by trying to figure out, well, it's a basket of goods. It has some things that are up more. And the issue is that for the average person, you're not buying an average of all goods across the United States. The average person is buying mostly gas, food, and rent slash mortgage payments, right? And, then, and that has gone up significantly more than 5%. So how, what's your advice to uh, Nicholas Erpe? Hello, love you, Nicholas Erpe. Great to see you today. And I'm going to read off some cost of goods mm -hmm. um, in the restaurant industry here. What spaces and sectors do you feel are most vulnerable or susceptible to this disposable income mm -hmm. pitch that Main Street is suffering right now? Mm -hmm. and, let me, and let me read this to you, okay? Yeah, yeah. This is from... Matthew Jennings, a chef. Fryer, this is tied to cost of goods in the restaurant industry. Mm -hmm. Fryer oil was $21 12 months ago, $35 six months ago, mm -hmm. and is north of $45 today. That's Fryer oil. Two times. Chicken wings, $45 a case 12 months ago. $175 plus a case today. In a year, it goes from 45 to 175 That's like four times. That's ridiculous. That is, that is 4X, basically. 4X. Takeout boxes, you know, the to-go containers, $25 12 months ago, $95 today. This is the same for cleaning um, ingredients, cleaning supplies, paper, and most of the food utilized in restaurants. 
It's no surprise we're seeing an uptick in menu prices for restaurants, mm -hmm. especially locally owned mom and pop ones. Mm -hmm. I say this because I encourage everyone watching the program to be empathetic, mm -hmm. patient, mindful of cost of goods increases, and understand that it's not the restaurateurs that are dictating these increased menu mm -hmm. prices. It's the market that is doing this. Mm -hmm. They cannot serve a meal that's going to cost them more money than it is that they make or bring in from serving or selling exactly. said meal. They, Anywhere you want to go on it's, this. And there is a temptation. You can't give into the temptation of thinking, oh, goodness, you know, the, the, the restaurant owner must be greedy. Because he's, you know, his prices are up ten percent. Well, everything he everything he needs to produce this is up more than ten percent. It's up two times, four times. So you got to be understanding this. That especially the small business owner can't eat that. The lot, the the maybe the the big chains, right, can say, well, we'll take a loss for a little while to to protect our market share, right? But the mom and pop shop can't eat those costs. They're trying to put food on the table. So that's a, it's a major impact that you have to think about, that the same food increased prices that are increased for you as the, as the home buyer are the same prices that have gone up for the restaurant tour, and that's not something they can avoid. So what do we do? What do we do to survive? What do we do to survive? What happens? Where do we go from here? How long is this going to last? What's the future? Um, is this something that we're going to see throughout 2022, or is this something that starts... Um, waning come Q1 or after the holidays? Goodness, I hope not. I hope, I hope it begins to, to wane. I hope that this proves temporary. Um, as, as my dad was sort of saying this morning on Real Talk, these are external factors that are contributing to this. In other words, we don't have inflation because the economy is overheating. No one would accuse this economy. We're not even back to 100% of where we were in January of 2020. And in January 2020, we didn't have this type of inflation. So this isn't an overheating issue. This is an issue that is external, a shock to the market, like a market shock, a supply shock, you might call it. I and think so we have, uh, I think we may have a power outage. Do we have a complete power outage here, J-Dubs? Are we, is the Wi-Fi on? Because I'm not seeing that on my end here. That's what you're, you should mainly be focusing on. We got a power surge here power in downtown surge. Charlottesville. <laughs> Dang, we were right on a hot spot. I, I want to know, though, if we're on air or not. Before we say know. anything, let's right see now. if we're on air right That's now. J-Dubs should be telling us that now as the director. <laughs> J Dubs, are we on air or not? Key, uh, Alex, do you want to check? We <laughs> have a power I'll surge check. in downtown Charlottesville. We are unsure if we're on air literally as we speak. Oh, so we're still, okay, we're still on. We're so still keep going. Live. Dude, we're we are, still live. We may have the only. The show will go on. Okay, we're still going. Finish so, your thought. There you go. All right, we're, we are still live here. Um, no, I was thinking, my thought was in terms of us, so I, I, I certainly hope for the economy for Main Street that it is temporary. In terms of how we react as investors, um, you, you just, you be a little more cautious. In other words, Sith Little is who's gonna be most affected. By Sith Little, that unfortunately it is your restaurateur. It is, you know, if there's less discretionary spending, it is gonna be the hotels. It's gonna be anyone associated with vacation. It's gonna be non-essential services. So it, if you're in one of those industries, the luxury brands, that's where you're going to start to see your, your impact. That's where you might be hurt if you are investing in those companies or if you're in that line of business. Um, so that's, that is something to think about there. In terms of Main Street, you just have to try to push through it as best you can. I mean, I feel, I feel for all of us out there that are, are dealing with this, with this struggle. There really is nothing that can be done. I would just say don't panic, as my father said this morning, because... We, we've talked about this before, the endless cycle of inflation, where inflation breeds expectation of more inflation, breeds more inflation. Don't panic and try to like, grab up as much stuff as you can or hoard things, because that will just contribute to more inflation. So you have to just, again, be calm, live within your means, understand the importance of saving, even at this time, and just, think to, and just be prepared for, for what happens. We hope, again...